Good morning. Merry Christmas. And I think we might have to adjust this volume. It sounds like I'm about to blow the roof off, and we don't want that on Christmas week, do we? Welcome. It's good to see each and every one of you here with us today to come and to grow closer to our Lord. Um, if you would, um, if you're joining us from home and watching on Facebook, there is an order to our worship service that can be found at centenarychurch.com. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for this time of worship. Let's join responsibly for our greeting from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, all his angels. Praise the Lord, all his Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, 
sea monsters, and all deeps. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above earth and heaven. Our opening hymn this morning, Joy to the World. Let us pray. Lord of mercy and joy, you have given to us the blessing of your Son, Jesus, 
who will make known your presence, forgiveness, and love to each one of us. Be with us this day and keep our hearts and minds open to receive your love and peace. Enable each of us to be people of joy and hope as we encounter others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I invite you to direct your attention to the overhead screen, uh, both those here and at home, and let's see where Amber is in the world this week for our children's message. Let's pray together our prayer for illumination. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Isaiah chapter 61, beginning with verse 10 and continuing on to the next few verses of chapter 62. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. <clears throat> you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. <clears throat> Our epistle lesson today comes from Galatians chapter 4, beginning at the fourth verse. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke, second chapter. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the failing and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then at night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God, and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to favor of God was upon him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of all times and God of all places, silence the voices in our minds and in our midst except your own. We pray and we beg today that we can hear you guiding our hearts and guiding our lives and that we respond in ways that seek to serve you and only you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've heard some folks say recently that they can't wait for 2020 to end. It's almost over because I'm ready for something normal. I've even been guilty of saying that some myself as well. You know, it's not likely that some kind of phenomenon is going to happen over the next four days that's going to automatically turn off the switch of everything that we have been experiencing overnight. But perhaps we're all feeling a bit nostalgic, especially this time of year. We want things to go back to normal. But what does that mean anyway? What does it mean normal? Even aside from the pandemic, what does normal mean? It seems to me like through the years and over the last few generations, We've watched this long, unraveling spiral where the people of faith have been putting their own hope and their own faith into so many other different buckets than the one that we're called. It's hard not to fall into the traps like this because, quite frankly, they're placed everywhere. They're strategically everywhere that we find ourselves. Mixed messages come from all over the place from the news, to advertisements, to the way social media seems to know us better than some of us even seem to know ourselves. Have you seen the, the advertisements and the suggestions that come up in your social media feeds? It's like they're feeding off of you and the things that you like and trying to give you 
more of that stuff rather than, I don't know, stretching us into different ways. It's crazy. My devices all seem to know a few things about me. They know that I enjoy listening to vinyl records. Yes, I know. I'm way beyond my time. And that I must love John Wesley and Jesus Christ an awful lot. I look at these ads and, and all of this stuff's there. Uh, and then we're, there's not stuff about Jesus or John Wesley or, or stuff about vinyl records and where I can go buy all these things. There's other ways for me to fill my life with playing guitar and playing music. People, businesses, institutions, entities, they want to influence us. And, and in turn, they, they want our influence. The best advertising is word of mouth. They want us to influence their products or what it is that they're selling or showing or getting out into the marketplace. They want our time. They want our money. They want our voice. They want us. They love when we put on clothes that have their logos or wear hats with their brand on them because, well, it shows that we're wrapping ourselves with them and it shows to the world what's truly important to us. Careful. Before too long, the next thing they may want is our complete trust. And friends, that's called faith. And that's reserved for one and one only. Faith belongs to God. And yet we see people increasingly relying more and more on their own wit, their own intellect, their own brain power. They think that they can provide for themselves things that create fullness of life. And friends, I'm sorry to say, no human being can do that. So what are the ways that lead us to life? And perhaps much of it is linked to what I alluded to a minute ago. The very thing that we're... Sin can seem fun. Sin can seem exciting. It often makes us feel good. It often, it often makes us feel alive. It's a deceiver in that way. But people dress themselves in it. They put things on that make them feel comfort, comfort, that make them feel safety, that bring feelings of bliss, brings them comfort, they think, or safety, filling up, satisfaction. And over time, as they begin to cloak themselves in these things, we can see that moral compass began to sway. Friends, as we grow older, we often have a hard time parenting ourselves and saying to ourselves, No! You can't do this! It's for your own good! And so perhaps that's why the 61st and 62nd chapters that we heard from Isaiah just a few minutes ago are so vitally important for us to reconsider today. We're reminded that to be children of God, one has to allow God to be the parent. Because, friends, sometimes we are just children that are incapable of dressing ourselves the way God would have us dress. And so Isaiah makes it clear that God does the dressing if we're to be dressed in certain elements. There's not another way. But instead of your mom and dad or your grandparents going out and getting you clothes that went out of style three or four years ago, that's not God's way. Isaiah says that God has dressed me with a garment of salvation and wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. Getting dressed by God, not only does the fashion never go out of style, but it's life-giving in ways that are beyond comparison, in ways that no organization or other entity can provide. Paul writes in the book of Colossians, as God's choice, you who are holy and loved, put on these, put these clothes on, put on compassion, put on kindness, 
put on humility, put on gentleness, and put on patience. He adds above all else, clothe yourselves in love and let Christ's peace rule within your hearts. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, gentleness. These are all incredibly important virtues. And we should be wearing them at all times, whether we're at the grocery store, whether we're in traffic, whether we're taking a walk through the woods or our neighborhood. Wearing this type of character clothing demonstrates to a hurting world that, friends, we are not pushing our own agendas, but that our goal as Christian brothers and sisters, there is one goal. And that goal is to always be reflecting Christ. So let's think about each of these words that we just shared a moment ago as we navigate. The first one is compassion. And it's sympathy in dealing with others and their situations. You know, that person who's struggling to fit in, or that person who might be giving you a hard time at work. Oftentimes, we, we come across these situations and we have no idea what that person is dealing with outside of the present circumstance. When somebody's acting out or acting in that type of way, it's often not the genuine issue. It's often poor choices and, and poor behaviors that we show as a result of times in our lives when we just feel stuck. And so what does compassion do? Compassion looks for that opportunity to care for people where they are, however they are, and to love them regardless of their situation or how they might have found themselves in that situation and regardless of the way that they've treated us. The next one is kindness. So kindness is, is active and it's very intentional consideration of other folks. Anyone can offer kindness, but for the Christian witness, when we offer kindness, it's understood more as a response to Christ's love for us and Christ's grace for us. Think of it as compassion taking action. It allows us to look for ways to care for Christ's people and show Christ's love. We represent Jesus whose very kindness is what drew people to him. The next one's a little more tricky. I want you to repeat it after me. Humility. Humility. Right. Humility is a tricky one. It helps us to see ourselves as less important than others. It helps us to put others ahead of our own selves. That's a very important theme for Paul. In, in Romans, Paul says in the 12th chapter, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. And then over in Philippians, Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourself. And, and James gets it too in talking about humility in the third chapter. James says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. The next one's meekness, meekness or gentleness. That often involves courtesy and consideration for others, even to the point of waiving our own rights for personal gain in order to lift up someone else. This piece of Christian clothing is sometimes mysterious and is strange to us. We're not sure what to do about it. But Pastor Rick Warren shares in his writing something that I think points to um, a way to un unravel this a bit for us. He says that we've lost the true meaning of meekness. Meek doesn't mean weak. Jesus and Moses were both described as meek, and they were certainly anything but weak. 
Meekness really means strength under control. Now the last one before we move to love is patience. Patience is the ability not to become frustrated and angry when others intrude or interfere on, on order. But instead, offer forgiveness for what we perceive as their shortcomings and God willing, they will offer us the same grace for our own follies and our deficiencies. After all, Paul says, we ourselves have tested the patience of God with our own sin. So just as the Lord has forgiven us, we must also offer forgiveness. And then the last virtuous piece we talk about is love. All of these virtuous pieces of character clothing are vitally important. They're paramount for the Christian life and the Christian traveler. But the one piece of clothing that we take with us everywhere we go, like a faithful warm overcoat, is that of love. For you see, Paul says that love binds everything together. And it binds it in perfect harmony. But unlike an overcoat, this coat of love is not a seasonal item that we wear. In fact, it's more like an outward identity of who we are. And it's seen through every word that we speak or every time we choose to remain silent. And it's seen through every action we take or every time we turn our heads and pretend that we don't see. Paul writes about this outer garment elsewhere throughout the New Testament, but in 1 Corinthians 13 we read about this word love, that it's patient, that it's kind, that it's not self-seeking, that it doesn't keep a record of right or wrong, and it always rejoices with the truth and in truth. In short, Genuine love is the goal of the disciples' dress code. It's fashionable everywhere. It's always welcome. It's always appreciated. And it's always needed. I say probably now more than ever. God doesn't force us to wear these garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. But they are offered. God leaves it up to us whether or not we choose to, to put them on. A freedom of choice. In our Christian circles, we usually refer to that as free will. In the second epistle, Peter says, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, regardless of what we've done, the only way that we can cut ourselves off from God's invitation is to A, reject it, or B, not respond to it. Free will means that we have a real choice as it relates to our destiny. Not to choose is, in fact, to choose. And that's a fact we'd probably like to eliminate from our religion if we could. We don't like being pushed around into a corner where we're forced to say yes or no. Our faith would be so much easier if we just took the parts of it where we get to speak words of encouragement and comfort to one another. Instead, we're confronted with having to choose yes or no, either to accept Christ or not. To stand back in silence and simply watch the events unfold or to become active with other brothers and sisters in the faith and to stand up with and for them showing love for not only friend but also foe. For not just our neighbor but for complete strangers. And to do it like we love ourselves. You see, because the gospel has to do with real life, it asks us to eventually commit ourselves all in or all out. 
God is simply not satisfied with anything less than that. There's no room for middle ground. There's no place for being wishy-washy. And there's no place for lukewarm Christianity. And so the choice is yours. May yours be one that pushes you to grow. May it be one that stretches you and allows you to relent to God's will. And may it be one that offers you abundant opportunities to witness of God's miraculous love for you and the miraculous clothing that He's adorned you with. Let us pray. O oh God, our light of the world, we come forth from the darkness into a new dawn. With the dawning of your Son, we sing forth your praise. For now the earth has a Savior, a Christ. Grant us wisdom and grant us courage to follow him faithfully. Through exile into the lands of Egypt, through his childhood and youth, through the trials of doubt, through the times of persecution and testing. Even as our Savior leads us, we know that He brings the goodness and blessing of God for each day, for new birth, for new life, for the path ahead into final glory. And so we give our thanks and our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is a, is a combination of two hymns together. Let us sing, We will glorify the kings as well as Jesus Name above all names.
Join me in uniting together in the historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he is from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We thank you for your continued generosity throughout this season that we've experienced over many months now. Uh, at this time, let us offer our gifts before God and our service to that of the work of Jesus Christ's ministry.
joys and concerns. Uh, I do want to share a joy. Paul, thank you so much for the, uh, what you just shared during our time of offering uh, Bethlehem morning. What a beautiful selection, and I think everybody in here was blessed uh, to receive that this morning. Do we have any other uh, praises or any celebrations to share today? Almost, almost, almost. Uh, Becky actually, she, <laughs> Becky just shared with me a little bit of go that uh, Mike is actually at River uh, River Point Crest Nursing and Rehab Center, but is on the men doing better and would appreciate our continued prayers uh, for him at this time. So thanks for sharing that uh, with me just a few minutes ago, Becky. Um, also, we do have. Um, a couple of prayer requests for Kay Ragland, who has had a difficult week and a half or so. Please lift her up. Uh, prayers for the family of Bob Maple. Prayers for Ron, uh, Ryan Hart, as you may know him, a wind from our other uh, uh, traditional style service at 8.30. He plays the accordion, uh, but he has been down for a couple of weeks and would certainly appreciate your well wishes and your prayers. And also for Mark and Susan Crawford, Susan who usually sings in our choir, and Mark who does our sound at our 11 o'clock service. Mark's been down for quite a while, so we continue to lift them up through this difficult journey that they've been, that they've been on. Do we have any other concerns to share this morning? It does indeed. We, we have a strong music ministry here at Centenary, uh, Paul being our director of music ministry and, and the music that flows through all of our services, all three on Sunday mornings. Um, we are just truly thankful for all of you who participate in, in the ministries at Centenary. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord of light, and Lord of abiding love, you have shown us in the person through Jesus, your Son, a new way to live. You've poured your light into the world, and you've asked us to live in light rather than to run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promised to be our light all of our days, and you asked us to place our trust in you. The journey, not our leftovers, but our vote 21. To be a stranger, damaged relationships, loss of loved ones. Let your line shine bright. Let it bring healing and hope. And help us to be bearers of that light by the way we carry ourselves, by the garments that we wear on both the inside and the out. For we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. And all of God's people came together in the company of heaven and prayed together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Um, and I, I did have one other note that I missed. It was under another sheet of paper, and it was just given to me before this service. Um, Corey Oliver, who is very close to Bishop Arthur Trout and his wife Mabel in South Africa, 
we found out uh, this week that uh, the bishop's wife, Maybell, has passed away. So please lift that family um, who's connected to this family, but on the other side of the globe. Please keep them in your prayers during this difficult time. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us close together with our final hymn this morning, the first Noel.
news. And I just got some more good news and I feel compelled to share. Uh, I just got a text a couple of minutes ago that uh, Kay Ragland was taken off of the ventilator and she's up and talking with her family and doing better. So continue to keep her in your prayers. Just glad we were able to share that bit of news to, for our departing time. Receive this benediction. Servants of God, depart now in peace. Prophets, go in power. For we have seen salvation prepared by the merciful hand of God. With Mary and Joseph, may we ponder these things. With Anna and Simeon, may we praise the Lord. Let us grow and be strong that we may find wisdom. And may God's hand and ours hold the hands of the earth's children. Amen.